good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure uh, for me to be here with you and, and share the works that we have been doing at the University of Sao Paulo, particularly on, on the connections uh, between food security and climate change. Uh, welcome for those uh, who are coming to Brazil for the first time and for those who are returning. It's a pleasure to host you here at uh, the University of Sao Paulo. And I think we have a great opportunity here to learn from each other rather than um, teaching you something new. It's, um, it's an opportunity for us to exchange um, our experiences, our works, and, and to work together in a such disciplinary, interdisciplinary uh, group of professionals like yourselves. So it's a, it's a great pleasure uh, to be part of this initiative um, organized by Incline and with the support from FAPESP. Um, uh, before I start um, to work with you on food security and climate change. I would like to, to do a little bit of exercise. Uh, although the group is, is big, uh, we'll, we'll try to engage you with uh, two exercises today. The first one, we'll start with uh, these post-its. Okay, so take one uh, post-it and pass around. Uh, take one of these. Each of you, so you can um, so what I will ask you to do um, to warm up, I know that you had a good time this um, weekend, so it's just to uh, wake you up and to make you work. Instead of me working, it's going to be you going to be starting working and do a little bit of exercise. So the idea to use these post-its is it's kind of a, a memory stick or something that we'll keep um, as part of this um, the group contribution to understanding of food security um, and for me also to learn from you how much you know about the about the issues okay so I will ask you to write um, just uh, one word or maximum two words um, uh, the most important thing that comes to your mind about food security and climate change, okay? Just write one or two words. Um, please, don't write food security or climate change, <laughs> okay? <laughs> write whatever you want, but don't write texts here, okay? Just something that comes to your mind um, that is necessary for us to address here uh, in the next few hours, okay? If you want to, um, to write something that you do not know, probably that I do not know either, or if you want to write something that comes to, uh, in terms of importance, of something that uh, is related to your works that has some connections with food security, just write these words, okay? Do not write, and please write with very big letters, uh, uh, so don't write small because uh, as we are getting old, uh, we cannot see it. So try to write as, in terms of the letter size here, as big as possible, okay? Do you have any questions? Uh, as as uh, a couple of words. Less, less is good. Too much is, uh, we'll have to take a lot of time to... Um, uh, to work on these, okay? Uh, do uh, all of you have uh, post-its? Yes? Yes? If you're, if you finish, 
uh, pass uh, the post-its uh, to the front. I will ask some uh, from the organization committee to place the post-its there. Uh, or I'm not sure if I'll be able to. Uh, oh, good. It's mine. <laughs> uh, person, um, we can start from there. I would like a couple of volunteers to look at these uh, post-its, uh, at least. Uh, and then we could also spread the post-its, uh, if you prefer. We could have another one there. So uh, uh, a couple of vol volunteers to come here uh, to the front uh, from your side and try to look some patterns of key issues uh, that are related. So please, uh, uh, before I start asking you to come directly, any volunteers? I'm not going to ask you these guys here. Please come. Um, at least uh, three or four. One group there and another group here. Uh, I would like you to organize and to look at the answers or contributions that you have, that you had written. Uh, so then you'll be looking at issues that are connected or issues that are interconnected. Um, um, good. So the, the suggestion is uh, once you start looking at this, see what are the key words that are related to each other or redundant. And then you group in, in major themes. And then you explain, say, this is how I, we, we did this. OK? So uh, put it all of them, and then and then you start looking at the, the patterns. Oh, okay. Okay? okay, it's better to look at all the oh, okay. contributions. Okay. Yes, help them. Um, as they are as they are doing their work, um, and then they'll will come with their, the rationale they are, they are using for organizing the themes. I would like to, to uh, reflect on a couple of things. Um, so um, I'm, I'm very positive that um, Professor Marengo and a few others came here in, in the first week and shared with you some of the findings of the last IPCC report, right? Uh, and, and then you know about the process that came after the, the Climate Change Convention in, in 92 that was a common understanding that we need to have a very solid, even before the convention, a very solid scientific basis to explain, to understand, to quantify the effects of climate change on, on different um, uh, environments and different situations and, and in different, I would say, scenarios, right? So we all know about this. Um, and as we gather more and more information about the impacts of climate change and also the behavior of climate in different scales, we evolve from the first report to the current report, right? So it was an evolution of, of data, of the organization of the data, and also the evolution of the, of the scientists in terms of um, the ability of scientists to communicate to the society, to, to communicate to, 
policy makers about the importance of have a very rigorous approach and a very scientific, but nonetheless, uh, a message, a narrative to communicate all the findings from the IPCC, uh, thousands of scientists engaged with this process to communicate to policymakers about what needs to be done, right? So this is common understanding to all of you. So for all of us that are engaged with climate change issues, regardless of, of the area, can you, can you tell me uh, how the IPCC reports have been organized and the logic and the rationale? Just to start, have you looked at the IPCC reports or the groups? How many groups in the IPCC report? How many groups, working groups, as, as the document is structured? Three, four, three? Four. So how many groups? The first one. Huh? Sign, scientific basis, right? To understand um, the numbers, the big numbers that Professor Marengo probably explained. This is the group one. Group two. Impacts. Group three. Adaptation and mitigation. And for those uh, who found uh, uh, group four, we have three, right? Main groups. So the, my question is, where the theme of food security is placed? Where in, within these three groups? Adaptation, mitigation, where? Huh? Vulnerability, impacts, basic science. So did you guys uh, uh, organize the, the structure there? So can, can you come here and explain? Although we need to use the mic, so please come. Uh, share your name with all of you and say what you do. <laughs> Just to say my name is X and I work with Y. So it's good to, uh, so then we'll start uh, a little bit of uh, energy. Okay, good morning. My name is Ezequiel. Uh, well, Where do you come from, Ezequiel? Argentina. Sí, nuestros amigos argentinos, bienvenidos. <laughs> Vamos. I'm a physician, like a medical doctor. Check this. Uh, the main question here is um, one paper that say finding the resource, and this may be uh, is the, the finite, most important finite aspect. Finite resources. Finite so resources. we have a very limited availability of resources available. So, And then uh, we have um, a moment, maybe in the next few de decades, that um, are represented The, the representation of, of the next few decades are uh, a very vulnerable socioeconomic situation uh, characterized because uh, for hunger, starvation, vulnerability, poverty, and other socioeconomic aspects. So this is very important for us. And then um, in line with final resource are uh, the water resource that is very important for uh, agriculture and food production, and obviously uh, agriculture. So here we have uh, firstly, uh, firstly, agroecology, water, food waste, crop diversification, uh, overgrazing, agricultural practice, um, decreasing in cultivated areas, GMO foods. Um, and this is related with health, obviously, because without food, uh, we don't have health. So health is here. And to accomplish this agricultural production, we need to uh, uh, apply a lot of practice, characterized maybe 
uh, of uh, higher food consumption, pesticides, competition for land, pollution, if we don't uh, do the, the right thing, greenhouse emission, planification, and obviously uh, adaptation, global consumption drop, adaptation strategies, inequality, justice, and knowledge. Perfect. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to uh, uh, round of applause to Ezekiel. <laughs> now we have uh, other colleagues here. Okay. Hello. Uh, we have uh, almost four groups. Uh, almost four groups. Uh, the first group uh, is what is related to water, water disponibility, and water security, and water management. Okay. Uh, and water uh, is related to the agriculture, um, food, food production, and uh, food uh, crops development, and rural communities development. Uh, then there are the that are related to um, uh, equity and. Um, uh, equity and land use. Land use is related to the deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions. And um, what else? Yeah, and like in the transversality, we have uh, malnutrition, human health, and Uh, many um, uh, measures for adaptation and mitigation that are related with any any other any each each other each one issue water food uh, production and energy uh, <laughs> she she didn't say uh, her name so okay. please uh, Sorry, May Malin. So from Venezuela. Uh, gracias. Um, so thank you, thank you very much. Um, as you said, there there is a I would say a huge amount of um, information or perception that you have that are of very intrinsic um, nature of complexity. Uh, that this theme that we'll be sharing with you, discussing with you in the next couple of hours implies. So it's not simple. And, and this is why um, a lot of uh, words that were captured by you, that are written here, um, implies that it's very hard for us to have a single uh, professional or a single, let's say, area of knowledge that encompasses all the connections that are necessary, and also is very intrinsic to the discussions of climate change, because uh, that is related to economics, that is related to development, that is related to understanding the causes of climate change. Um, and somehow agriculture is, uh, is also seen as almost a villain in this process, because implies that we need to occupy more land and therefore, we are expanding so, and affecting the process of land use or changing land use. So land use changes as reported by all the IPCC reports, especially in countries like Brazil or countries where the agriculture frontier is, I would say, is expanding or moving. So in one hand, we have a tremendous opportunity to help or to contribute to malnutrition, to contribute or to reduce uh, food insecurity in different places, but also agriculture development and also food production is seen as, as a source, as a direct impact on climate change. But climate change is also impacting food security because um, 
constrains the availability of resources. It, it causes a lot of instability, uncertainties that in most of the cases are non-controlled so, and we cannot predict. And it's very hard for us to predict um, all the complexities that will happen in the, in the next 10, 20, or 30 years um, in terms of food production, but not in terms of a single crop production. So my statement now, so to introduce you to, to start thinking, is how can we um, design a much more climate-friendly system of, of bridging these two issues in a much more, um, with the vision of long term, uh, that agriculture could be a little bit smarter and then we could continue uh, to feed the world. So this is a, a great challenge. This is probably one of the greatest challenges that we'll have in the next 50 years. Not, uh, of course, that we are, as you saw yesterday in the G20, uh, that the U.S. decided to leave all the discussions about climate change as of uh, the summit um, documents from yesterday uh, reflect that a totally, um, I would say, um, lack of willingness of the current president of the U.S. to accept this is something important, even negating the, uh, let's say, um, the goals that the U.S. had assumed in the Paris Agreement, as you are aware of. So anyway, so just to, to start moving into something more concrete, I will show you some of um, uh, slides in the next half an hour that probably will try to make the bridges between the different themes that you um, uh, chose as priorities for you. Probably I'm not going to address every single one, but I will try to make a thread that a line that will be connecting these themes. Um, a, a, another comment, as we have been sharing with our students here in Brazil and overseas, is probably um, the biggest challenge for a professional, any professional, that will be working on this theme is not to have all the answers, but it's how we are going to be asking the right questions. This is probably when you start doing your PhD thesis, your master thesis, or completing your works, you spend much more time thinking on the questions. Once you start analyzing and structuring the problem, it will be easier. So probably it's very hard for us to structure uh, a, the problem uh, of the interconnectivity of climate change and food security and on food issues because of the interdisciplinary nature that the things brings uh, us to, uh, to start thinking. So probably I'm, I'm not going to give you all the answers, but my goal here is to help you to start asking the questions. So then you could look at your own fields of research uh, as you have a very broad group of people with a very um, interesting knowledge um, that you're coming to, to this um, uh, workshop, to this two-week uh, intense uh, training workshop. But the, the beauty and what give us the, um, the feed to go ahead is how you will be interacting in this course and how you'll be um, making the necessary bridges between the themes. Uh, usually when we have uh, students or professionals that are come to, uh, to work on a theme, they'll be looking at actually, actually working at very small lens. But what we're trying to do is because how we structure science, we structure science in silos sometimes. I understand this, I understand that, I understand these. I'm very specialized on this. So, but it probably the answers that science will, um, that will make a striking contribution is how we'll be able to move from a small lens 
to a bigger lens and to solve real problems. So I would say that food security, it is a real problem. So that requires you um, and require us, uh, to all of us, to work in a different way. So, and to have a very concrete example, um, in the final hour of our discussion, uh, I pretend to uh, work with you. Uh, my intention is to work with you, or you're going to be working together in groups uh, using a methodology called design thinking. Uh, have you used design thinking? So I will try to introduce you briefly with a, a, a very participatory approach to look at um, problems or context of a problem and trying to come with a solution, either a prototype, either an idea, either a, uh, a narrative to a policymaker about how can you address the problem um, providing some solutions. So this will be the end of our discussions today. Okay? Okay? Yes? Thank you. <laughs> Just uh, um, any other questions that you have or any reflections that you would like to, to have? Uh, although we have a very large group of people um, and it's very hard for me to interact with each of you, because it's, it's a big group of people. I would like to uh, feel comfortable to ask questions and also to participate as much as possible, okay? I know that is, it's hard, uh, and I hope you, I'm being clear to you because of uh, English or because of cultural differences that probably you don't feel that participating, but please don't hesitate. Uh, raise your hands or say, I, I agree, I don't agree, I have a different vision. Um, and, and again, the beauty of having this such a diverse group of people is unique, is that you have a unique chance to work together. So I hope uh, we'll be able to do this using the design thinking approach. Although it's, uh, we'll, the auditorium is not the best place to do this, but we'll try. My comment is a um, few uh, years ago, I almost like food security because my thesis is about food security and public policy. But now I uh, to link to climate change, um, SDG, and biomass with because my work is in uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras with a dry corridor or corridor seco. So any specific question or you no, just... Okay. Uh, so um, I'm not sure if you heard. Um, uh, she's working on probably biomass availability or uh, simulations of bio biomass availability in three different countries in Central America. Um, and she's looking at probably... Um, uh, CO2 uptake by different uh, strategies for bioenergy, right? So, and, and she might be measuring or understanding the opportunities for biomass and thus that is being affected by climate change uh, on the supply of uh, bioenergy sources, may, maybe for thermal purpose for generating electricity, right? So anyway, we'll, we'll touch some of these um, issues because this is one of the ways that um, agriculture uh, or landscape, a landscape could mitigate the impacts of climate change. It's a good example because we will be deploying a opportunity for renewables to mitigate climate change. So there, uh, there are a lot of works uh, on this issue, uh, especially on the use of renewables either from biofuels or bioenergy to mitigate um, some of the impacts of climate change, okay? Well, I will use just one microphone and she's saying that I cannot use both. Anyway, I try to use both. Uh. So where is the... 
So um, the structure of my talk today, as I said, uh, I'm, I'm giving you the context. Now we are in discussion of the context. Um, so then we all will have the same um, field uh, of understanding of the same baseline as uh, scientists uh, like to use the baseline. So then we uh, will will share some of the importance of these works. And then we'll be discussing uh, the core, which is food security and climate change. Um, and then draw some examples from Brazil and overseas. And then um, design uh, a couple of solutions that I hope you'll be able to use your creativity, your capabilities to look at some of the solutions uh, of any of these themes that you address. So it's going to be as open as possible, but the theme should be connecting with a solution related to climate change and, and food security, okay? And then um, my concluding remarks. Um, well, this is probably, uh, as you said, and, and uh, here we are discussing uh, finite resources. Um, this is a recent report from um, a um, large consulting group. Uh, I will give you the references later. Uh, the only probably slide that doesn't have a reference is this one, but it's coming from um, McKinsey Institute uh, that we're looking at um, uh, the impacts of some materials, especially um, these eight materials, steel, aluminum, plastic, cement, glass, wood, primary crops, and cattle, uh, and the impacts of the use uh, of these resources on emissions, on climate change, on global house emissions. Let me see here. So eight resources or eight materials use uh, or are responsible for 20% of uh, greenhouse gases. Eight materials are responsible for approximately 95% of water use. As you said, water has been one of the issues that permeates um, our discussion here. Um, and these resources represent 88% of land use uh, in the global. But we need to, to see uh, how and what are the alternatives that we have to mitigate the risks. Which risks? The risk is for either overuse or the risks of the business as usual model to continue, continue to deplete the resources that we have, um, which is scarcity and price fluctuation. Why I'm saying price fluctuation? Because when we have a price uh, of a product that is defined, that is commercialized in large volumes, this is a typical behavioral commodity. Um, and there is a lot of fluctuation of this, which is especially for countries that does not, do not um, add value to their resources. They're selling cheap prices because the behavior of these products are commodities. So you're not adding any value to that. So the richness of their resources is dispersed because you're selling so cheap. So um, as as probably Professor um, Marengo and others came here, we have a huge, I would say, volatility um, uh, of the climate and also on the resources. So to contemplate some of these issues and going beyond the, um, the, the Rio Plus 20 agenda, uh, the UN decided to look at these issues in a much more, I would say, uh, interdisciplinary way. Uh, view, and they start looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and to what extent SDGs will be addressing uh, the themes that are actually some of the themes that you're discussed here. So, and then we have um, 17 SDGs, and several of these um, are related to the topics that we are discussing. How many uh, of you are aware of the SDGs uh, documents? 
So it's good for you, for those who did not have a chance to look at the SDGs, because this is probably the platform, the global platform, that all UN agencies will be working in the next, I would say, 10 years, uh, and working with um, other players and other stakeholders to address this. <clears throat> And some of the issues that we're discussing uh, are related to, uh, to this uh, periodic table that you've seen from early ages of your school uh, years. Uh, and this um, reflects the darker blue, reflects the scarcity of the resources. So darker means more scarce in the next uh, few years. So in lighter means a little bit of viability. But most of the things that we use are concentrated on the center, which means all these minerals are overused. And these also are usually non-recyclable. So we use and we, we discard. We use and discard. So this is true for several of the materials that we use or we are uh, deploying in food production systems as well, especially nutrients and also especially um, metals that are the basis for several value chains. So the point that I'm trying to make here is when we look at the food production, we cannot look at a specific crop per se. We have to look at the entire value chain. Not the value chain of a single crop, the food value chain. So we have to look at these in a much more complex way. <clears throat> the other way of looking at this is how countries or how different countries are using a specific resource especially in this case of steel. Uh, this is one example. I could use uh, any other examples. Probably you're going to be asking yourself, saying, well, we, we are here to learn a little bit of food security and how, to what extent, steel relates to food security. It relates to, to food security in different ways because there is no single, let's say, value chain that is associated with food security that does not use steel as a main source, either to plow the land or to build tractors or to uh, produce automobiles or to uh, create new infrastructure. So this is an example um, to show that in 2030, China, China will be using the same amount of resources that we use in 2000. This is almost the same number which is 700, China in 2030 will be using more steel just in a single country that the entire world used. Um, so it's a challenge. I'm not saying that we cannot use the resources, but how we are using these resources. Um, very little information, uh, I would say, um, and data in papers are making this necessary connection be between resource use and the availability of these resources for food security. Another issue, um, after I would say um, several years of prosperity, because the world never, never um, experienced uh, a long-term prosperity as we see in the last 30 years, as we faced uh, um, now. So what does it mean? It means that we are living better. We are consuming more. We are eating, in theory, better. We are consuming more protein. And the worst, we want very cheap food, right? So we want everything to be cheap, right? Because uh, we w we're probably not willing to pay uh, for something that will be taking into account the, the long-term, let's say, impacts of the system that I'm using um, and to contemplate 
for what the economists think in terms of externalities, right? So very few, I would say. So how many of you, uh, I would say, if you're choosing um, to buy food, vegetables, um, sometimes you do not have this availability, but I would say, how many of you know how, how much uh, CO2 equivalent a food um, is um, used or consumed to be produced? Have you looked at the label to say this has uh, impacted or has this X of liters of water to produce uh, beans, uh, rice, um, pork, meat, vegetables? Um, probably we're not aware because it's something that is, we're taking for granted because food needs to be in our plate, right? Uh, and, and we are talking just about availability of food. And then we'll be looking at the other um, pillars of what we call food security. Uh, and we'll discuss with you based on FAO's um, papers on what food security is about. So my point here to emphasize this is that probably the era of cheap resources or cheap food will be ending soon. Do you agree with this? What do you think about this? Um, how many of you know um, how much water is used to produce one kilogram of protein, meat, red meat? 15,000 liters. Any other estimates per kilogram of red meat? Red meat. Beef. Red meat. Okay? Beef. Beef. Beef, 5,000 liters, right? 15. One, five. 15,000 liters to produce one kilogram of meat. What is the world's production of meat? of 250 million tons of meat times 15 liters. How much water did we consume? A lot of water. But, uh, but this is the, the figure that we come to mind. We are consuming a lot of water. How much land do we, do we have, arable land, do we have in the world to produce food? Do we know? What is the surface of the world um, that is potentially used for agriculture now? In percentage, it is 5%, 10%, 12%, But this, this global view, overview, large number, reflects the local differences. So this is another challenge. Because the local differences that varies from your country to your country to your country is huge. And, and, and this is, again, is also a challenge that you see when we, you downsize the global circulation models, right? When you have a global circulation models that gives you the general overview of what is happening or probably what will happen in terms of climate at the large scale. But the difficulties and probably the challenge is how we downsize, right, the models to actually measure what is happening in your local regions. So this is a major challenge. This is not different from a food production system. When you think in terms of food availability, we think in terms of large numbers. Uh, which are the key players? Which are the key countries? What are the major crops? So according to FAO, the food security system is based on probably 10 major crops only, in theory. Because when we go to Africa, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and you look and ask for um, farmers there, especially the, the women that will be cooking or uh, gathering uh, fuel wood, 
or trying to find any source of energy to cook, probably we will find in a small, let's say, community living in Burkina Faso, probably will gather probably more than 20 different crops in a single uh, soup that will be uh, eating in the night. So the challenge is how can we guarantee that the diversity of that agrobiodiversity presented in a local scale cannot be, I would say, reduced because there is a lot of uh, things that we need to take into account in terms of food availability, which it passes by social economic issues, cultural issues, to uh, global scale. Again, this is the beauty of trying to understand this, and this is the complexity. So what I ask you to do um, also when you go for a coffee break, they probably take one of these pens. Uh, we don't have many, but probably uh, our colleagues will find a little bit um, more of these. And let's draw a map of the interconnectivity that we have between all these issues that we'll be discussing uh, now. So then we have a large panel, drawings. If, if you're very good, um, um, good on drawing things, do as, uh, be as creative as possible outside. Here uh, we'll have um, um, a couple of uh, white, large pieces of paper uh, fixed in the glass. So please use that to make your contribution um, to think about all these complexities and trying to draw something or write uh, words uh, to leave for us to return also when we start thinking of a solution, okay? Is it clear? So please use the whiteboards uh, that are being fixed in the glass here outside. Uh, use this and try to be as creative as possible, okay? Uh, ideally, it will be to have someone here, while I'm talking, to be drawing this. While we are discussing this, someone will be drawing the multiple pathways that we have to address this issue. But as we don't have this, we'll, we'll do this outside, okay? So let's move on. <clears throat> Is it clear uh, where I'm, uh, I'm trying to um, instigate you to think? Again, again, it's not my intention to be here and uh, to teach you something. Because it will be almost impossible for me to teach you something. Probably you're much more capable than myself to uh, address some of these issues uh, in fine tuning and uh, in, in fine details. Um, you are much more skillful than myself to uh, look at your local problems uh, because you, you come from a different perspective. You understand better your system than myself. So what I'm trying to do here is open your eyes, open your ears to start uh, revisiting your own research questions and say, well, this is missing. Why I'm not interacting with those guys that are working with economics? Why I'm not interacting with those guys that are looking at high-scale uh, modeling systems? Why I'm not working with those guys that are working on um, resource availability, water, for example? Why I'm not looking at those guys that are making the necessary connections between climate change and health? So again, your works implies that you have to work with other professionals. And, and this is, and there is not a single truth that one single professional will be able to cover all the complexities and the beauty of the horizon that you have in front of you as the next, I'd say, scientist in the next 30 years. So be as creative as possible because we'll need someone. We need a new breed of professionals that will be looking at beyond a specific box. Because the next, let's say, uh, quality papers that you're seeing 
as you see more and more, um, to publish in science, nature, all these uh, seminal works and papers that have an impact, if you look at the uh, authors, they're coming from different backgrounds. You've seen more and more um, broad papers that are trying to encompass all the complexities. Um, as we've seen uh, a recent paper in Nature in 2013 about probably one of the best works on, uh, that is related to food and climate change. I will, I will touch on, on th some of these papers. Okay, so again, trying to work with the others and, and trying to work and listen a different perspective because probably your own perspective is not the most valid one, okay? So why, why is this important? all these issues that I'm trying to share with you. Because we are measuring growth. We are measuring our growth based on GDP, but probably GDP is not the best way of measuring growth. Because there are different, I would say, indicators that implies that our society is, is being, I would say, moving towards a different uh, era of prosperity. So maybe GDP is not the right one, the only one to measure this. Because even though we are growing GDP, the depletion of resources is growing. So the gap is getting bigger. So in here it was a little bit, let's say, stable. But now we are decoupling this, and, and we are putting a lot of pressure on resources that probably will cost more. And we have to change this. Are we ready in terms of policy making? So which countries are ready to do this? As we've seen the, I would say, very bad behavior of key players, especially uh, players that could make a difference, and they're deciding to withdraw of the major, I would say, broad political issues. So what we're seeing is we're taking three, four steps, I would say decades, that all the IPCC reports uh, and also the scientists we're supporting, uh, and we are just going back. So it's incredible. <laughs> it seems that we are not uh, living in the same world, right? So it's totally um, uh, insane. But I'm, I'm still optimistic that we could do these changes, and somehow we need to. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here, right? Uh, and and we need to engage at our own, I would say, level of influence, local policymakers, regional, and even at national, and try to convey a message. So the issue of policy readiness, I would say there are some good developments in different countries, countries that are um, driven by, I would say, economic interests, or driven by a genuine interest on reducing greenhouse gases. The, example that, the examples that we've seen on the deployment of renewables is a very good example that is supporting especially uh, the use of different sources of energy beyond uh, oil. But the problem is oil is still available in large quantities. And we are relying on cheap gas now, especially about fracking, uh, about other sources of um, fossil fuels that is uh, constraining the penetration of renewables. Um, so, and then when you go to um, the cluster here, uh, that is equity, uh, food issues versus uh, social issues, um, we have to think in that Agriculture, it is very important in terms of job creation, especially at a local scale. Do you know what is the percentage of the global population lives in cities now? 20%. 20? More? Cities, cities, cities. 80? 50? 50? We are around 60 now, and probably Probably, but again, there's a huge variation, right? So developed 
or industrialized countries versus less industrialized countries. But the projections for 2030 is that we're moving from 58 now, that is a figure, to go to almost 70. So again, as you saw, that we are using more resources and we are leaving the, the country to move to the cities, which is, brings a, a, a cultural challenge for us. Because usually cities, uh, next, uh, last week we have been discussing a lot of these issues between the interconnectivity between rural development and cities uh, outburst. Because cities, as you saw in different regions, used to be, city used to be the best discovery of the uh, societal. Because we gather, we organize ourselves, we organize jobs, and we increase, increase the complexity and availability also of the resources. We had better, I would say, water when we moved to the cities. We had infrastructure, but now we have crime, right? And now we have uh, a social crisis, and then we have, um, let's say, uh, overused of water consumption. And as you saw in this large metropolis of Sao Paulo, the challenges for you to move around used to be a place that you like to move, but then it's hard for you to move around, so mobility. So again, all these issues. And how do you know that we'll be able to feed a city, uh, a major powerhouse in the future? So cities are powerhouses uh, in the future, and it will continue to be that. But how food will be delivered, uh, integrated, and will, I would say, food systems will connect to uh, this thing. Another issue that we have to look. Um, you have talks, uh, probably you had last week and probably you have this week, about the impacts of cities on climate and the circulation of uh, aerosols, uh, pollution, local pollution. So again, in, in a lot of cities, for example, um, in Africa, large cities in Africa, or large cities in China, or in Brazil, the very urban agriculture that supplies vegetables are the outskirts of the cities because of logistics, which means either you are using bad quality water to, uh, to use in the system, or you do not have water to uh, use in the very urban areas, which means um, how are we going to continue to supply, in terms of local markets, uh, food, diversity, diversity of food, not in terms of 10 crops, but the, what is available around the cities. So again, this, there is a huge connectivity between um, urban development and willingness, or uh, let's say people, to move from the field to the countryside, to the cities, because they think in the, in the cities they have better quality of life, which is genuine. <clears throat> um, again, and then, the, but there is some, I would say, light, or, or some a light in the, annual, in the end of the tunnel. But as you've seen, have you seen this, this figure? Sorry. Yes, please. Have you seen this picture? It's probably what is IPCC is saying when it starts in 1990, right? Um, and those guys are in the platform. My question's on the previous slide. Um, with the so-called decoupling of GDP and resource uh, use or overuse, um, I noticed that that's a projection, first of all. And I'm interested to hear your opinion about how this decoupling will occur because it's very theoretical at the moment. I mean, some countries have managed to decouple, but that's because they're importing resources. Like China. Uh, yeah, or, or other countries, you know. Um, so I can't see that GDP can grow, um, at least the way it has in the last 100 years or so, with uh, our uh, resources continuing to grow almost proportionally. And while there's been a partial decoupling, I think what is necessary is a almost complete decoupling. So I'm just interested to hear your opinion. 
Uh, no, it's a very uh, interesting question. Um, uh, some of uh, his points are important. His questioning about, um, let's say, especially what is happening uh, in some countries like Europe <laughs> that is very stable in terms of economics or GDP is not growing at all. And Europe is reducing the consumption of resources. But it's very particularly true in countries that are very stable. Um, and I would say where technologies and innovation had contributing a lot in terms of um, reuse, for example, reuse of water, in terms of uh, reduction of greenhouse gases emissions, moving to renewables. So I don't see that this issue will, Europe will be facing. But you have huge, I would say, uh, large or vast areas or countries that this will be the norm. Because uh, the baseline for some of these countries are very low and expecting uh, grow, growth. Uh, and, and they will be supplying these resources not for the development of the country itself or value-added products. Even in the case of Brazil, Brazil exports a lot of minerals, unfortunately. And, but we're not using all the richness to process that internally and to add value, unfortunately. So, and this is where I see the terrible disaster that we seen, that we saw in Minas Gerais, um, let's say almost nine months ago, wasn't a good example um, that, um, of the leakage, uh, terrible leakage uh, problem that we have, that all the impacts remain here <laughs> and the richness, or let's say the wealth <laughs> moved to other places. So I, Again, I don't have the answer, uh, but I, I think this is, uh, again, back to, back to the issue of um, regional differences. Um, some countries reached uh, a momentum that they care about what is happening in the future. Um, it would be nice to, uh, would say, reduce this asymmetric difference that we see between countries. I think this is the challenge. Um, anyway, I hope I... Uh, start illustrating. Um, um, again, the IPCC started uh, raising the flag from the 90s, even before. Um, and, uh, and it is going ahead. It is spreading the word. And then we reach now 2019 and say, something is broken. <laughs> the disk is broken. Because we have say we had said that, but who's listening to us? So anyway, again, the message here is we cannot talk just to the converters, to our own church, which means we have to go outside our circles of scientists, the circles of the equals. So the only way for moving the message is that we moved away from our own circles of people. Is it clear? Which means we're just talking am am amongst ourselves here. Probably all of us are aware, of course, because we work on this thing. But it would be nice to have guys also here from the private sector, guys here from the other areas, guys here that are making decisions about designing products, designing things, or uh, guys that are making cars that could be using less resources, or guys that are um, designing new molecules of fertilizers. So those guys will be um, impacting less in terms of greenhouse gases. So this is probably, uh, let's say, a greatest challenge for us. It's to spread the, world beyond, the word beyond uh, our uh, friends and family. So back to more uh, on the materi uh, materiality. So I'm using the next slides. So we're using FAOs. You, you know FAO, right? FAO is the agriculture organization from the UN based in Rome. But there are several ones. Um, um, and by the way, last week, um, the General Assembly of FAO or the, um, the general meeting of FAO that happens um, every five years, the, the broad 
not the annual meeting, but the a very large summit of FAO uh, that happens every five years um, uh, was happening in Rome last week. And the main theme was food security and climate change. So very, uh, I would say, <laughs> timing. Uh, so the theme was, was exactly the theme that we're discussing now. Again, um, feed demand, food demand, fuel demand. Uh, on the population. We have different projections, but nonetheless, um, uh, even if you don't believe that the world will have um, 9 billion people, uh, probably will be around this figure. So, which means we have more people in the world, um, which is uh, the, one of the projections that we need uh, to double, in theory, the food production by 2050. Uh, so this is a general figure. Um, to summarize some of the findings of, uh, uh, of FAO, especially uh, the General Assembly of last week, um, is saying that we made a huge progress to reduce uh, undernourished population. Um, undernourished population uh, the definition is when you are lacking uh, a certain amounts of um, calories in terms of calorie um, that is uh, affecting uh, your development. Uh, I will come back to the definition later um, because this is impact in terms of the figures, the overall figures that you have. So uh, we reduced uh, by 100 million. But we're still now moving into more fine tuning. As you know, the, like a learning curve of any process. So we know what are the major, I would say, factors that are affecting food availability. But now we are moving into food quality. So which means um, nutrient deficiency, which we need to take um, to the next step. And, and some of you wrote um, there, uh, as a keyword, GMOs, right, or transgenic, right? Some, some of you wrote transgenic. Um, for those who wrote about transgenic, um, why uh, oh, you don't have to uh, express yourselves and uh, uh, raise the word uh, why you said that, but there are a lot of controversies, right, about GMOs. Um, researchers in India say we need to um, add vitamin A as in terms of um, nutrient deficiency rice production. So I will create a very, let's say, winner rice, a super rice that is um, providing additional sources of vitamin A. It's a great idea, right? Uh, on the other hand, I'm deploying a lot of um, gene constructs a lot of biotechnology to add um, genes that will uh, enhance my capacity to sell more of our products, of some of the products that I'm deploying, i.e., if I put in the market a seed that is toler tolerant to my herbicide or a product that will protect uh, my crop from a specific pest, but that implies that you need to come back to me and say, sell me more food. Or when I don't protect that gene to escape, and that gene could expect escape, right? So there is also a lot of controversies about GMOs, right? Some believe that could solve uh, local problems, like in the case of India, uh, Philippines. Or I could deploy or use a use land that is very salty. So I'll be developing uh, several genes that could grow in salty uh, soils. Because a lot of soils, uh, because of the heavy, heavily used of fertilizer, are not suitable for agriculture anymore. But I have a technology now that could uh, grow uh, a crop in a salty uh, environment. Um, 
so there, there are a lot of works done on nutrient, nutrient um, especially micronutrient deficiencies that are associated with GMOs. So a lot of companies are interested in working with uh, this solution specifically. But for those who are on the other spectrum, say the richness of food diet is the only solution. If, did you see the, the difference? But if we are affecting the availability of this agrobiodiversity uh, uh, array of plants, of species that we're using, will increase uh, nutrient deficiency. Is it clear what I'm saying? So, and, and this is very critical because if we reduce the availability of very specific crops locally, and, and those crops, uh, seeds, leaves, roots, tubers, all this diversity of crops that used to be present in a single soup or in a single meal uh, that takes a lot of time to uh, produce and has been a lot of time to cook. But because people are living uh, in a much more, let's say, harsh environment or around the cities, they do not have time to prepare food anymore. And, and you know this, what is happening in Mexico with the advance of fast food. So obesity, uh, it's, a major, it's a major outbreak in, in Mexico. So, and diabetes, because of simple, I would say, uh, lack of capacity or because people are spending more time or moving around or working, they do not have to prepare a healthy food. So again, it's how cultural differences in the availability of cheaper food is affecting the availability of the diversity of the food that was avail available before. Um, so now, uh, this is the definition that probably uh, um, the next speaker uh, will use. And she said, uh, Weber, if you're going to say a few words about this, uh, I will skip and I will enter into the examples uh, that she has uh, in northeast of Brazil. So she will use this as a framework for you to understand uh, the principles of food security. Four words. I would say food security, according to FAO and other organizations, are based on four key words. Uh, the first is availability. As, as I said in the beginning, we, we increase the availability of these resources, right? Because you're producing more. The advent of green revolution that uh, intensified agriculture uh, reduces uh, this, some of these risks because we are providing more food. So the first one is availability, volumes. The second one is access. Um, access, um, which is entitlements, uh, which means um, I have the option. Sometimes you do not have the option. Um, because of force, uh, market forces or because of uh, uh, climate change. Um, and then utilization, because you are aware of the diversity of your diet, because you have the, cap the ability to process food, so quality of water. So if you're living in the outskirts of a city, you do not have access to quality of water, for example, there to produce. Um, sanitation, and then stability. Stability is the opposite of instability that we've seen because of climate change. So the four pillars of, of what we call food security are availability, access, utilization, and stability. And then finally, uh, a paper uh, that, uh, that I said in science, um, this by Wheeler and Von Braun, a uh, very interesting paper um, saying, summarizing, I'm not going to read this, but I'll just say a few words about this paper. Uh, for those who are uh, into this um, theme or into this, uh, uh, interested on this um, topic, um, which is not new, especially the first one. So climate change impacts food security in places that are already stressed. Places 
uh, as you've seen from my, my previous speakers, climate, uh, ch climate change exacerbates uh, the problems in already stressed places. So places that will be uh, suffering from severe water scarcity uh, will, s will suffer from food uh, scarcity too. So the problems will be exacerbated, the first. Um, and then the second one, uh, global undernutrition and malnutrition um, will increase. So that gap probably will increase. And by the way, uh, only in the, um, you know the number of the IPCC report that we are? Five, right? Just uh, starting from the IPCC report three, that the words and the themes of climate, uh, food security came. So as you saw from, from 1990, the first one, um, almost uh, 10 years later is that the theme of food security start uh, showing up in the um, uh, IPCC report. Um, the other issue is inequalities. As you saw also some of you, your words here in terms of inequal, uh, inequalities from local to global, especially local. Um, communities, people are vulnerable to the effects of weather, extreme weather, uh, and will continue to be because the changes that we have in temperatures, uh, precipitation, has a dramatic change in food availability as well. And as you saw from um, modeling of crop yield, uh, is there anyone that are uh, here that are working on modeling crop yield or productivity? Single crop or multiple crop? Single crop. Which crop? Maize. Maize. Soy and maize, rice. Why you are working with single crop? It's easier, right? Of course, <laughs> you want to finish your work and you want to get your thesis done. You don't want to spend 20 years in a, an, an agenda that is unsolved, right? So you want to finish. Again, a lot of works on climate change, impacts of climate change and food availability are based on modeling of a single crop behavior. But a single crop behavior doesn't behave in the field and landscape as we expect. But nonetheless, it's important, right? So your work is very important to us. Continue to do this work. But trying to, to add different variables or different ins insights into your model, which is complicated, right? Um, um, again, and to finalize this, extreme events are likely to be more, uh, to be more frequent. Now, how can we reduce the risks? Sorry, go ahead. Uh, microphone? microphone. I had two, but uh, I'm not supposed to use two, right? So I, I try. Thank you. I have a comment about GMOs. Uh, I think that GMOs are a good tool to combat climate change if they, they are used in a right way, especially in a, uh, to combat food insecurity in a uh, uh, climate change in a scenario. But almost all GMO crops are used to devote animals, to arise animals, to produce meat. So we have to do a question. GMO crops for what and for who? I fully agree. Uh, um, he's stating that, um, as, as I said, most of the crops that are in our plate, uh, or sorry, in the statistics, like soya, <laughs> soybeans, uh, corn, a little bit of wheat, uh, are common feedstocks, uh, especially uh, corn and soybean, are typical feedstocks for production of protein animal protein, uh, which according to the ecologists, according to uh, uh, other professionals, are 
a way, it's a much less efficient way of producing food because it uses much more resources, right? Uh, and I will come with some numbers about this. And most of the solutions that are GMO supposed solutions to uh, a problem are driven by these large commodities. Uh, there are few, I'd say, exercises of going beyond. It's because the vast majority investments are done by large companies that have resources available. There are some good examples that some NGOs or foundations are trying to uh, break this. But yes, uh, yes, but um, we'll come back to this, okay? But it's an important question. Um, to whom and where and how will be deploying the technology. It's not going to say that the technology itself is bad, but it's how it's being used, right? Again, the same uh, old uh, rhetoric question. Um, so we have far reaching, this is a summary of another paper uh, in a uh, sort of new journal, it's called Global Food Security, and has a special issue in, uh, if you're uh, looking at those uh, recent numbers, uh, this um, paper is found in this um, uh, issue of glo uh, global food security and it has probably six or seven interesting papers that will be in the reference, will be uh, available to you later. Uh, the, thing, uh, the summary of the, the paper uh, must suggest aspects on other than crop yields. <laughs> As, as we are seeing here. Um, why why uh, other than crop yields? Because there is a, a very interesting hypothesis that crop yields also, when you're modeling just crop yields, you do not model um, the interactions between the crop and pests, for example, and diseases, and the dynamics of pests and diseases uh, in relation to um, um, uh, higher or lower atmosphere in, in control environments. So you're modeling uh, CO2 uptake, photosynthesis, uh, ecophysiological patterns, but then uh, you're not actually testing uh, all the potential combinations of climate change and increased uh, CO2 concentration on the dynamics or in life cycle uh, of the pest or the disease or the interactions with the water, for example, um, in different landscapes. Uh, weeds, how the, the crop also is affected by the population dynamics of new weeds that are, will be uh, com competing for the resources. Uh, but again, it's a challenge. So this is what it says here. Um, and here it says, it, it depends how you read this. But it's saying action-oriented research is a priority. What does it mean? What does it mean, action-oriented uh, research? Yeah, to bring some a solution or to research that it will be. But I wouldn't say that what you're doing is not useful, right? Because it's basically saying something is useful, the the other research is not useful. But it's. Um, but in agriculture development, I would say a lot of experiments. And, and what we are lacking probably is what we call long-term experiments that will be measuring these things uh, in a long term in the field, in the real condition. And we could have the opportunity to do this. But because of shortages of uh, resource availability for research that um, requires large pieces of the land or the landscape to be monitored, to be assessed beyond the, the flux towers, right? You've seen that a lot of uh, uh, interactions between uh, soil, vegetation, and the climate are being measuring uh, carbon flux or carbon and uh, nutrient flux using towers, right? Have you seen probably some of the uh, previous speakers were, were discussing some of these issues. But sometimes you cannot capture what is happening in the field. Um, so again, it's a different ways of uh, doing research um, long term. And I would say that we're not ready, unfortunately, uh, yet. Uh, we tried, and we have a very few examples or samples 
uh, of trying to do this. Very few concrete examples, long-term projections, because it's very, it's very complex and takes a lot of time and, and resources. Um, and here is important. Stakeholder-driven portfolios of options should be a focus of research, which means who are uh, the guys that will be benefiting from our research? Are we are working with farmers uh, and those guys, uh, why don't we um, do something different? Rather than just installing an experiment in a greenhouse, uh, we need to think on an upscale of the, not downsizing, but upscale the experiment. There are several um, groups, well, I would say several, a few groups that are trying to do this uh, in the field and to look at large scale experiments. But uh, truly, uh, that will be interacting with the with the having the landscape as a source of the, of the data. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, it is how can we combine adaptation and, and mitigation, because they are uh, interconnected. Uh, can I adapt to the challenges of climate change, and cannot I also I mitigate? And I will give you some examples of cases that. Uh, smart agriculture or agriculture that is more friendly to climate could try to reconcile both. Uh, so to adapt and to mitigate. So again, it's, it's uh, how can we move into um, um, a real problem. So managing landscapes. This is a photo in the south of Brazil. Um, and uh, intercrop, uh, intercropping is when you combine um, one crop with another one, and the landscape is not as uh, homogeneous. It's a very uh, unique combination of an experiment, uh, not an experiment, sorry, in a, a concrete example. Uh, although we are measuring this on large scale, we are very, uh, I would say, happy with the outcomes. So this is wheat and, and timber. Eucalypts um, that are planted in a very successful way by farmers in one state in the south of Brazil. Sorry, what is the name of the crop? Eucalypts. Wheat and eucalypts. It is a crazy combination. Huh? So who said that? No, who said that? You model for us. As I, as I said in the beginning, it's good to have an expert here, right? <laughs> right? So, yeah, so how much uh, liters of water eucalypts uptake? It's like six times more, more than a, a native tree. A native tree. Yeah, six times more. So, uh, so where do you come from? Chile. Chile. We have lots of eucalyptus there. So, um, do you know uh, a, a lot of eucalyptus? What is the area of Chile in terms of agriculture? Do you know? In, 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 in actors or percentage of your, I think it's about twenty percent. He's saying that Chile is a, uh, a country that is constrained by the mountains, right? And 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 uh, and you have very few, I would say, land available for agriculture. Um, what is the area of eucalypts in Chile? Uh, it's a little bit less. Uh, uh, Brazil, the area of eucalypts in Brazil, it's eucalypts in Brazil is five, around almost six million hectares. Chile is a little bit less. It's 2.5 of eucalypts. Um, and he's saying that eucalyptus consumes a lot of water. So where does this water go? So as a tree, when, so when a tree... Again, uh, it depends how you measure co water consumption, right? So when a, when a crop, uh, I'm, I'm not going to details, but it's good that you emphasize this. He's saying this is very bad because it consumes a lot of water, right? This is basically his statement. No, it's good to, to it's a crazy combination. It's a crazy combination. Uh, crazy combination be, because uh, because of the water consumption from the, the, the 
out. But is this bad to that the water goes to the you cloth? Have enough UV, you have a, um, you know, enough water for the whole UV, and it stays much colder in the light. But I so it depends, right? It depends. So the message is it depends. Probably in Chile, which is much drier, so if you uptaking water from the soil, right? <laughs> no, but I'm saying that it depends. So you have to measure this. I'm not taking any, I would say, emotional view on the science here. So we have to have the numbers, right? Yeah, but the, the UV indicates that uh, after you stop the UV, you have to create some sort of I agree. I agree. So I'm because saying. You, you want to, to be ionized. Sure. Uh, to be disrupted. Sure. Because I think this is a, a production of chemical technology. Well, again, the answer is how you're using the technology. I'm not advocating that it's good or bad. It's how we are deploying. I'm not saying this is a very good combination for Chile. I'm saying this is a good combination for some areas in, in, in south of Brazil, in Rio Grande do Sul. And why I'm saying this? Because farmers are very wiser. It's wiser than we are thinking, right? Because those guys do not take it for granted. Right? Have you, some of you uh, went to a field to uh, plow the land or to work or to, to work with a farmer for a year? No? How many of you uh, have experience on, with farmers or farming? Is it easy to, to farm? It is very complex because you don't control the, all the variables, right? If you, are, have, if you are in an industry that you have a, uh, a very, I would say, a couple of inputs into the industry that you don't take, uh, you don't take uh, into account any of the life cycle of the products that are coming into the automobile industry, but you continue to use the cars, right? But we don't know how much water we use uh, in, a, in a single car. But we, we know that we are consuming 15,000 liters of one kilogram of uh, protein. Do you know how many liters of water we use to produce one car? Do we have a life cycle analysis of one car? But we are, my point here is, let's get the numbers right. If you have the numbers, probably, which is good. And even in Brazil. Exactly. The main message that I'm passing here. No, it's good that you raise, which is, uh, it makes us think and challenges us. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, this debate, no, no, this debate in Brazil, this debate of water use and water consumption by eucalypts, we started almost 30 years ago or even longer. So a, a bunch of scientists, which I could connect you to these uh, guys, which is good. Uh, created the very long-term um, monitoring plots for water consumption in eucalypts, um, measuring uh, water consumption in small watersheds. Yes, go ahead. So again, he's, yeah, no. Uh, again, just to, we'll, and then we'll break, so I'm not taking this to polarize the discussion. But again, there are at least two di dimensions that he's saying. There is a spatial dimension, which is this, how you combine different crops. Uh, and the other one is the temporal dimension of, um, of this crop in the field, which is how you're measuring if this is sustainable. So again, this is uh, an example. So uh, he's trying to help me. Uh, let's. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay. 
So a couple of things. This is a very windy place. So eucalyptus is, is providing a sort of a windbreak uh, to reduce the evapotranspiration from the wheat. So it's, uh, in that sense, it's good for the wheat. Um, this is um, just a two-line tree uh, interspaced by uh, uh, three line of harvesting. So you have um, a much, um, I'd say, 85% of the land is wheat. And just eucalyptus is providing a, a sort of uh, microclimate, uh, say, conditions to reduce um, uh, water loss and reducing the impact of wind. This is some of the benefits. Uh, if you want the numbers, OK. <laughs> uh, about the CO2, maybe the eucalyptus can catch a lot of CO2, Yes. something like that? Yes, uh, so eucalyptus is also, uh, this is the, probably the, some of the numbers that is, uh, but I'm not going to <laughs> to that detail, but it's, it's also doing this uh, here. Now it's good good point. Thank you. Please, I will be deviating. Uh, you mentioned that uh, FAO recently concluded a study about, thank you, sir, the, about uh, 10 crops that should be considered for food security. I don't know if you will mind uh, uh, listing them out for us. No, um, sorry, I, I'm, I, I wasn't sure if uh, I was clear in the beginning. I say I said in the beginning, if I understood your question properly, I said according to FAO, according to FAO, 85% of the global food security is based only on 10 crops, unfortunately. And all the diversity of local crops, which are much more relevant in terms of social development, in terms of local regional nutrition, are not taken into account because they are looking at just a, a large commodities, okay? So again, um, we have to have a break, as, uh, as someone said. Um, thank you for the comments. Uh, I hope you, can, you could come back energized to challenge me so I could challenge you. <laughs> and before we break, before we break, don't forget, please, don't forget to pick, do you have more? Espera só um pouquinho, espera um pouquinho. Ah. Ok, uh, guys, uh, just one second. Uh, this is for the whiteboard, so use your pen. Use your pen to write on the board all your concerns, issues, things, your drawings that are uh, two uh, glass doors uh, filled with white paper. So write something there while you're uh, taking care of food security now, because you're taking care of food security. Uh, watch out for sugar. Do not consume too much sugar. It's not good for your health. OK, so this is health. Again, take uh, the break to write something there. OK, guys? Thank you.